Hi everybody, and thanks for being here. So I'm Michele, and I work as an architect in Bonage. Now today, what I'm going to talk about is essentially contract testing. So first of all, I'm gonna go quickly about you know, what it is and why it's important. Then I'm going to mention like a couple of comparisons. So you know, with other type of tests that are more or less in every organization. And in the end, I'm gonna show you some code as part of this presentation to show you can actually structure contract test against the RESTful API. Now when it comes to that, I'm basically using Spring Boot, some Kotlin, and JUnit. So pretty much standard stuff, maybe apart from Kotlin. Right, so let's start. Now, what is contract testing, right? So I mean, I work for Vonage. What we do is essentially like multi-channel communications, both inbound and outbound. So essentially our customers, they talk to us through a public API and what they typically want is to deliver or receive messages to and from their customers, okay? Now, we also got like a bunch of microservices, so they're all talking to each other using like mostly RESTful APIs. There is some messaging, but it doesn't change too much. And we all work in agile, autonomous teams, sometimes extreme programming, so we do quite a few releases for each of these components, right? We got about maybe 50 of them. We release them at least once per day, kind of each of them. So it's a little bit extreme. And as you can imagine, there's a risk in all of this, right? Which is suddenly you do a breaking change and guess what? Your existing service in production cannot talk to the new version of the API and there's an outage and you know, we lose money and reputation. So nobody wants that. So the purpose of contract testing is to basically make sure that a release of a component is not gonna break its contract that its customers rely on, right? And if release passes this test, then suddenly you got some guarantees that the existing consumers are still gonna be able to consume your API during and after the release. Obviously, I mean, breaking changes happen, but the point of the test is to make it intentional. So you don't want to break things accidentally. If you really want to break things, then you know, so you can adjust the test and let it pass, right? Cool. So let's see how they actually compare against other tests, right? So the basic ones like unit test, right? Everybody know unit test, I guess. And you know, contract test, they basically focus on testing adherence to a contract. While unit test, they typically focus on the correctness of implementation, right? And as such, they basically allow you to avoid regressions, well, if you write them well, of course, but in the, in the main application logic. Now, contract tests, they don't do that, and typically the logic is stubbed. What they help you to figure out is if you're breaking your contract, okay, whatever that means in general. Now, unit tests apply to every type of function. I mean, if you're using Java, it's classes and methods, it doesn't matter too much. Now, contract tests, on the other hand, they only apply to this term, driving adapters. I mean, I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with that, but basically what it means is your inbound ports. If you think about, I don't know, you got a web server, now suddenly that's an entry point to your application. Like external consumers, they consume your API to that entry point. And so as such, each entry point will have its own contract test, right? Now, also unit tests do not typically or should not typically require external dependencies, while contract tests, on the other hand, they do require mock API consumers or even things, okay? Now, Integration tests. So I'm not gonna go over that part again because it's quite boring and it's there. But in terms of focus, so what we do in Vonage for integration tests is basically not like kind of trying to test the chain, but focus on the driven adapters, which is basically those parts that you call as part of providing a service. So imagine that you got a traditional, I don't know, Spring Boot REST application, which also talks to a database, right? Nothing new. Now, if you talk to a database, that thing is a driven adapter, as in you call it. It's not the other way around. Now, integration tests, they basically test the integration logic between your application and that database. And as such, they do require mock downstream dependencies. So typically, you don't want to run integration tests against the real database for a number of reasons. But what you tend to do is you embed an in-memory database or something that looks similar using test containers or whatnot, right? Now, system tests. Now, system tests are the tests, at least in Vonage, we actually try to figure out if you, know, you tested your integration, you tested the contract, you tested the logic, 
but does he actually work together? So are they wired together in a, in a proper way that it actually works? And, and you know, the thing is, they're great. They catch a lot of issues. If system tests are working, you're typically in a very good place. But on the other end, they're very slow because they apply a component level and you need to set up the entire stack with mock consumers, mock producers, and driven adapters, drying adapters, event, sync, and sources. So it's quite complicated to set it up, and they're slow. And the last kind of tests, end-to-end, -end, they're even slower than system tests because they actually focus on a platform, a set of components acting together. So what you want to see there is, yes, okay, I respect my contract, you respect yours, but do we actually understand each other's contract, right? So can I actually talk to you, and so on. So these tests are amazing. They catch every possible problem imaginable, but they're super slow. They require a lot of setting up. You typically have like test accounts, data, and environments, right? So in terms of overall test strategy, so once again, the, pro the, the point of contract test that they are much faster to execute compared to system tests. So you don't need to test the entire chain because that's low, that requires setups and so on, and can really help reduce the number of system tests and end-to-end -end tests. So what you want to do is you want to test for coverage using contract tests, and then you want a couple of epi and maybe one on epi case as part of in, like system tests and like end-to-end -end tests just to verify that you know, all the moving parts are kind of glued together. Right? So that's what it looks like. Unit test, fast test, and you know, like lowest possible scope, contract test and integration test, same level for like driving and driven adapters, and then you got system test and end-to-end -end test. Right, so that said, that was like a very brief introduction. Like I'm gonna talk about you know, how we can actually structure contract test for a RESTful API using a Spring Boot project, which if you work on JVM is quite traditional. I mean, a lot of companies probably using that, right? So <clears throat> I'll start with Swagger. This is like one pretty popular API specification framework, which wasn't mentioned before. It's not really a framework. Like, it doesn't do the work for you. It just allows you to describe your API. It's similar to JSON API in this sense, right? Or GraphQL. And so in this case, this is made up. We don't do contacts in this way in Bona. I just, I don't know. I have to say this thing. But basically, I sketched this, this Fake API, you got contacts where you can post the contact, right? And this way you can describe the request body, whether it's required or not, and what's the content type for that. And also you can link it to this new contact.json, which is the scheme of the payload that that post accepts. And I'm going to show you in a minute, right? And the possible responses are 201, well created, and you're gonna get like the location header or the created resource in the headers. Or for to do, the contact wasn't created because one or more fields were invalid, okay? Now, you also got like a get for multiple contacts, which once again is another HTTP method. It has a 200 response. For now, I'm not like focusing on error handling and so on. It's just the general idea. Then I'm going to show you the GitHub repository. You can find the code there and it's more complete, right? But basically, what it returns, if you consider this again, there's a new contact.json and a contact.json, right? So these two things can and typically are different because the latter contains an ID which is not in the former, okay? Then you also got like the ID specific endpoint. So in this case, traditionally you got like contacts and the resource ID. And in this case you support get single which basically takes in the path the ID you want to retrieve and can result in a 200 or in a 404 depending on whether you found that or not, right? And you also got delete, which acts somehow similar, in a similar way, but it basically either deletes returning with no content or will give you a 404 if it wasn't there in the first place, okay? Now, this is what I meant. So this is the way you do define your JSON payloads. So for new contact, you got three properties. They're all man like required for the sake of simplicity and they're all strings, okay? So it's first name, last name, phone number. Now, for the contact.json, you got your ID on top of these other things, okay? Which is typically returned by the server. It's not something you specify. Now, um, just to clarify, obviously you don't have to repeat all of this. Like Swagger supports things like polymorphism and importing other definitions. For the sake of the argument of putting on a slide, 
this is the way it looks like, right? So it's the same set of fields plus the additional ID. Right, so <clears throat> in terms of the actual project, the one atypical dependency you need to implement what I'm just going to show you is this average JSON schema, which is essentially a library that I use to verify that payloads comply to the schema definition, okay? So you need mostly, so who's familiar with Kotlin here? Like a little bit? Okay, cool. So I apologize for choosing Kotlin, but really good and resist. If you have any questions and you don't understand, ask me and I'll try to work you through, right? Now you mostly need two functions and let's start from this one here, right? JSON schema at. So this is an extension function. Once again, I'm not gonna work there for enough. Look up Kotlin is awesome. But basically the idea is that any type can have this function as an extension which takes a location and basically we fetch the Java class and open that location as a resource, right? And so as part of that, we'll also load it into the schema loader, which is from that library, average JSON schema that I just shown, right? So this will basically allow a test to specify inside the test resources what the payloads are, right? Or load it from the main resources, which is probably what we're going to do. Now, given that, that thing extends a JSON object. So once you have a JSON object, you will be able, after importing this function, to invoke a complies with a schema that will basically validate the JSON object against the schema and throw exceptions and fail the test if the two don't match, right? This is standard assert J. I mean, there's a library called assert K for Kotlin, but it's essentially the same thing, right? So you're able to fail a test and that's like pretty standard. <coughs> right, so this is the skeleton of the contract test, um, traditional like spring book test kind of example. So what you do with your unit five is you extend with spring extension and there's no test runner anymore. And you enable auto configuration and you basically like specify the web environment which will give you a random available port. So you don't have to basically air code a port and then you don't know whether that port will be available or not. That spring handles that for you and that's great. And also, like, you use this trick to basically specify the spring configuration as part of the test. So it will do component scanning and find the endpoints and wiring it together with your web server, okay? Uh, standard Spring Boot, if you have questions, once again, ask, but it's not the core demonstration here, right? So inside the test, what you do is you inject the local server port, because that's the one you need to talk to. Uh, you don't know a priori what the random port will be. And you also declare this thing, mock bin, which is pretty cool. It's probably one of the coolest things in Spring Boot test. And it allows you to declare a mock, like vanilla mockito, nothing more than that. And it will also inject that mock inside your Spring Boot application to replace your existing bin. So what I'm doing is I have a, like a controller, which obviously auto wires that service contract registry. And what I'm telling Spring Boot to do is to replace the implementation of that registry with this mock. So I can set up expectations and then the endpoint will call against those expectations, okay? Now, I also imported the two schemas. So this is one of the functions I was mentioning before, which basically allows me to import them so I can reference them later on. And let's see one of the tests, right? So is the I'm not covering the entire set of things. I didn't cover the lit because it's essentially identical to this kind of, and it doesn't add much. It will be in the GitHub repository, but let's start from get single. So we get single, what you want to do is you create a contact, which is like your standard Pojo login thing in Kotlin, and you give it some values. So the first thing is the ID, right? And then you set up your expectations. So you do when registry, gets invoke, we get of that value, which is the contact ID, then return that contact, okay? And then what you do, uh, and, and this is where Colin is also quite cool, it allows you to do that very briefly, is the idea of setting up your URL based on the port and localhost, of course, because this runs locally when you spin it up, but it will also pass it the contact ID from that object and it will do a get and get the JSON payload for you. 
So what that thing is, is a structuring declaration for a triple. So that will be the request, the response, and the JSON. We don't care about the request, so we call it underscore. Right? And what that JSON is, is a JSON object at this stage, which basically allows you to invoke the second function that I showed you. And the first thing I do, I just check the status code. Like, that's easy, I expect 200. So I do like, you know, assert that my status code is actually okay. Then the second thing I do, and this is where this library is very powerful, is I basically check that the JSON structure I get complies with the contact schema that I expect, right? And, and this is subtle, but it's quite important because the point is this. It is important to work coding against the JSON itself rather than parsing it and see that the parsing works because the parsing is entirely up to you. So if your customer, uh, I don't know, consumer, parses your response in a different fashion, if you test your response against your own parsing and you change your own parsing, it does not mean that your consumer will still be able to consume your response. While JSON is static, right? So basically, unless you actually see a change in that JSON payload, you're not gonna break your contract, right? And so by doing that, you ensure that the fields are all the required fields and there's no missing things and so on, right? And it's smart enough that if you put more things and it's still compatible, it will not create like a false negative, right? And then the last thing you do, which is, this is just common sense, is you parse your JSON into a contact and then you verify that that contact is indeed what you expect it to be, right? Right, so retrieval, I'll go a little bit faster because it's essentially the same idea. I create two contacts, one, two, I put in a list. I say well, registry.iterator, then return those two as an iterator because that's how I structure the API. And I also create the proper request based on the part, and I retrieve them as a JSON array, okay? Now, once I have the JSON array, I check that the status code is okay, and I check that JSON array also has the same size as the contacts list that I would expect. So as an example, if there are three, it will fail. And then what I do is for each element as a JSON object, based on, I mean, along with its index in that list, I check that that JSON complies with the schema because each element in the array must comply with the schema according to the API. And I also check that parsing that maps to the index contact in the list, okay? Now let's see POST because POST actually works a little bit in a different fashion. So you're like, you know, POST, could potentially return like a body, but in a lot of cases, you don't want that. You just want to return the location. And in this case, you might ask yourself, okay, what do we actually verify against because it's not body? And what we do is a little bit like reversed. So what we do is we create the payload we want to send based on the new contact over there, right? So I create a new contact, once again, same thing without the ID. And I set up my expectations so that when the registry gets invoked in terms of add with that new contact. It returns the ID I decided for it to return. And then what I do is I turn that new contact to JSON, and, I, and, and this is the important bit, right? So I ask her that that JSON payload I'm about to send actually complies with the thing that my service is supposed to accept. So after that line over there, what I'm supposed to get here is created. If this doesn't happen, it means that I broke the contract because that means that that thing is still supposed to be accepted, but the actual invocation doesn't, right? And then what I do is exactly that. So I, I check that the HTTP status is created. And on the other end, I also check that the location as described by Swagger contains basically the full path of what I expect it to be, okay? Right, so. Thank you very much. I mean, it was brief and probably nothing too exotic, but there you are. So we're hiring, supposed to say that. <laughs> That's the links, Twitter, whatever. And in this section, like focus on this one, GitHub, you can find the full code if you care, and you can reuse it if you want to. Thank you very much.